All right, well, thank you everybody for uh, joining us uh, for a lunchtime training session. Robert, uh, you're with us? I'm here. Perfect, Gord, you're with us as well. I am with you. Awesome, perfect. So a uh, little quick introduction on Eden Energy. Uh, so for those that don't know who Eden Energy is, uh, we were founded in 1981. We're a full service master distributor. Uh, we're certainly very focused on training as, as Robert and, and Gord can attest. Uh, our principal areas of interest and expertise are IEQ, uh, heat pumps, and uh, hydronic heating. My role at Eden Energy is I'm the technical services manager, so I'm responsible for technical training, field support, and uh, having the pleasure of hanging out with people like Gord and Robert. Um, Robert, if you want to quickly introduce yourself, I don't think you need an introduction. Uh, yeah, Robert Bean, uh, retired practicing engineering technician. Uh, with a keen interest in indoor environmental quality, and, and uh, today I guess really what I do is I do a lot of volunteer work with ASHRAE and one of their distinguished lecturers. And uh, back in uh, January when we were down at the uh, ASHRAE events, we got notice of this pandemic. And uh, so for the last uh, 11, 12 months, it's been a heavy study in it. And we're here today to really just sort of give you the 20 minutes of Cole's notes on COVID, just sort of the tip of the iceberg. That's what uh, that's what's going to happen. Off to you, Gord. Uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, Gord Cook, uh, President of Building Knowledge Canada and um, uh, formerly Air Solutions. Some of you would recognize me as the perhaps uh, uh, represented Vanny uh, Ventilation and Stratton as my partner's taken over that business now and still proud to be associated with Strat and the gang. But most of my time now is spent training education. I would say more on general building science as opposed to uh, HVAC work, but a lot of work on the HVAC side across North America. And of course, when COVID hit, I haven't haven't been on a plane since March 17th, uh, but transitioning to online training education. Building Knowledge does, works with 60 to 80 different builders in the greater uh, Southern Ontario market, helping them with programs like Energy Star, like R2000, Net Zero. And, and here's for mechanical folks on, on this call, the reason I'm so pleased to be here with Robert and Eden is there's never been a better time for HVAC. That is um, COVID notwithstanding, even, even with that or add that opportunity, right now there's so much going on in the new housing world and existing. Uh, with respect to um, energy efficiency, indoor air quality, uh, total building science, it's an, a, a great time. And much of the training I'm doing is mechanical training, but to builders, builders who are saying, I need to know this stuff. So I'm really glad that so many folks are on this call, very anxious to hear what Robert has to say about COVID and how that ties into the kinds of training that, that I'm doing for HRI and others on this topic. So thank you. Perfect. Well, thanks guys for introducing yourselves. Um, as you have questions, I can see quite a few people do have questions. Just be aware, we're going to handle the questions towards the end. Uh, so those who are tight on time get to hear the speakers and, uh, you know, we'll do questions more at the end of this. We do actually have two polls that uh, we want to throw up and just get everybody to vote on uh, before we start. And uh, so the first poll that I've just put up is... Uh, what technologies uh, have you been talking about when it comes to uh, COVID? Um, hopefully you can all see that poll. I can, yep. Perfect. So we're going to give it a minute just so that uh, everybody has an opportunity to vote on this. All right, so we're at 80% uh, of people voted, so I'm going to uh, just end this poll. I'm going to share the results, and Gord, if you can share those results, you can see them, I can't. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> um, well, first of all, thank you very much, because the leading one was ventilation, 94%. Second is MERV-13 filter, 63%. Humidity control at 56 and UV deactivation at 48%. And again, I'm going to be really curious, Robert, if you took those numbers to heart, uh, your thoughts on those numbers. So thank you folks for, for that. And I think that's going to concur with what Robert's going to tell us is appropriate. Yeah, that's in, it's an interesting uh, response. I mean, all of those have 
utility in mitigating risks. One of the things that I like about the question actually that Michael has put forward is about risk reduction. And um, these strategies that we see here are really just part of a multi-layer approach. And we're going to talk about some of that as we get towards the end. And we'll certainly talk about these technologies. And we'll get into and we'll address some of the other technologies that have come up. Uh, I get asked probably at least once or twice a week about some of the new Zippy stuff. And, and I have some thoughts about that. And there's been some actually some recent research work talking about some of the Zippy stuff and the things that we need to be concerned about. So. Uh, the results don't surprise me. It's good to see that everybody is considering them, and we'll talk about um, sort of how they fit into the the overall picture control of, of mitigating risk. So, awesome. So the last poll's running right now. Uh, so it's what applications have you promoted uh, COVID mitigation strategies in? And uh, so we're going to let this run for about another 10 seconds, just so we can get as many votes as possible and. Uh, Robert will let you share the results when it's done. So sure. It's always fun when you have uh, you know a hundred plus industry experts participating in training doing a poll. I think we should turn <laughs> the data over to the manufacturers. <laughs> well, one of the things I like right. about this is that you know we're it is just a 20 minute presentation so we're really just talking about the tip of the iceberg and and so the fact that we have everybody here participating it's obviously very appreciated um so we got some results there i do so i'm just going to share those results now and if you want to share them with everybody right so we have a lot of uh well 53 percent um in the offices which is good to see 29 percent residential 17 percent in medical and dental and then specialty retail in at one uh, percent. So it's good that we've got that. That's a good mix, and uh, happy to have everybody uh, here representing those areas. <clears throat> All right. So we're going to get into this. Um, <clears throat> as we've noted, this is just really the tip of the iceberg. It's sort of a lunch hour. You know what you really need to know. And first, we ought to differentiate between the virus and the disease, if you will. And so SARS-CoV-2, which is the severe acute respiratory syndrome, uh, Canova virus 2, is the actual virus itself. And when people end up with this virus uh, in their body, they can then develop a disease, which is the COVID-19. Why we bring that up is that because we have a lot of people that interchange those two terms and i and i don't want to get up on a soapbox about terminology because right now that's creating a lot of problems for us uh, particularly between the epidemiologists and the aerosol experts as a, we define droplets and aerosol and airborne transmission paths so i don't want to get caught up too much in the terminology but just be aware that you know that there's the virus itself and then there of course is the disease and of course, what's important about this is that being that it is a virus um, and it is transmitted in many different ways, uh, of course, you know, people being beside each other in close proximity, but also now there's research out there that can demonstrate that the infected person and the susceptible individuals, they don't need to be in the same location in order for there be, to be transmission and a reference to elevators where recently there was somebody that got into an elevator, unmasked, was infected, ended up leaving the virus in the elevator and then shortly after a family uh, entered the elevator and all of them contracted the disease. And so that's really important to understand that you don't have to be in the same space uh, that, that could be left behind and thus the reason why ventilation can be important um, and also filtration. So that's um, that. And then the other thing that's really important about the disease that we ought to know is that they're much like making a pot of coffee, you have a percolation time. You can be perfectly healthy, not have been infected and then get exposed. And it takes 
a number of days uh, before infections can start to de develop. And so you've got the sort of incubation period, and then you've got this infectious period, and then post-infection, of course, from the infection period on is really, uh, while we want the prevention first, so we'll try to obviously, that is a big part of it, is preventing infection in the first place, and we'll get into that uh, later on. And then from that, of course, is the period where you start to develop uh, symptoms, and then from there on, it really depends on where the virus <clears throat> landed in your body, whether it was just in your throat or in your bronchial tubes or down deep into the lungs and the alveoli. And then, of course, a lot of different factors after that will, will kick over uh, where, you know, maybe you'll just have mild symptoms uh, where or all the way to the very end where someone actually uh, passes away. And one of the concerns that is out there now is that those that get infected and survive is now that there's um, long-term symptoms and long-term uh, consequences, I should say, uh, from being infected. And these are everything from respiratory issues to neurological issues. And of course, they're discovering more as time goes on. So it's really important to understand that it's just not a matter of contracting uh, the disease and then either dying or surviving, that those that do survive, some of them are now exhibiting long-term consequences. And this could be, well, we really don't know, you know, at this at this point, what the impact could that could be on society and our healthcare systems. But it's going to be very interesting as time goes on uh, that, that we start to really understand the long-term consequences of it. So in terms of, you know, where if you want to go look at the virus and being infected and where that, as I mentioned, where the virus ends up in your bodies, it could obviously end up in multiple places and the body will respond. We do know that it ha for some people it affects their sense of smell. We know it can cause fever. We know it creates headaches. And then ultimately, in the worst case scenario, is that it ends up causing respiratory issues uh, where people basically end up drowning in their own fluid that builds up in their alveoli. And uh, that's just the body's response system trying to deal with the virus. And again, I'm not a physician. I won't even try to pretend that I can understand the science of what the actual body does. But just, just enough to know that as technicians, uh, HVAC contractors, building contractors, mechanical engineers, that which is who we're tar targeting here today, is that you need to understand that whether you're in your own personal life or you're in a contracting role where you're actually on a job site, that we don't know if you're infected. You don't know if the people that you're working with are infected and you have to assume that they are. I like to use the analogy of a gun that we're all guns and the virus is bullets. We don't know whether we're loaded or not and that anybody that we come in contact with is in our sights. And so really it's our conscious uh, that our, you know, our ability to say, okay, well, I'll protect you, you'll protect me so that we make sure that the virus doesn't end up uh, in our bodies. And so transmission paths, um, we have to understand that. And so when you're on a job site again, or out in your day-to-day -day lives, a lot of emphasis came early on from the World Health Organization and the Center for Disease Control in the US and other organizations around the world, heavily, in, uh, heavily talking about uh, droplets and fomite, which is contact. But there was, fortunately, a force in the industry, which was the aerosol scientists that have been pushing really strong. And I have been one of those uh, since day one. Uh, we intuitively understood that this was a virus and that it could be airborne, much like other viruses, and that we can't ignore it. And so that's why you saw earlier on that the Center for Disease Control changed several times, actually, it sort of a, wavered back and forth and now has come straight out and said that aerosols are a concern that we have to pay attention to it and again if there's anybody online that you know has an epidemiology or a virology background you'll know that there's lots of debates within the industry the terminology 
of droplets and aerosols. And I don't want to get into that debate. What I do want to emphasize for for everybody here that's a more of an engineering technologist or technician or HVAC contractor is that what we're concerned about is sharing the air of somebody that's infected or if we're infected, sharing our air. So let's use the term shared air to describe what we ought to be concerned about and we'll let the uh, academics and the practicing specialists debate behind the scenes what is in fact a droplet and what is in fact an aerosol and we'll, and we'll let that go. So the three paths, contact, droplets, uh, and aerosols, or those th those particles that uh, that we end up breathing in, and it's really important to understand that the virus isn't naked. Like it just doesn't come out of your body as a virus. It's actually a guest on a host, and the host, of course, is the respiratory particulate that comes out of your mouth, uh, nose, and uh, the quantity and the size of this particulate depends a lot on where the aerosol or the droplet was generated whether it's from deep in your bronchial tubes or from your nose or from your mouth and the quantity of those viruses in each of those particles of course is also a variable and that's what these experts are trying to understand and how much do you need to inhale uh, or end up with your mouth if you touch your mouth or your nose, which would cause, you know, an infectious response? So these types of things, that's when you're starting to get into the, the weeds. But for us as practitioners on the street, you know, working with clients and doing design work, we just need to understand that there are multiple transmission paths. All of them are controllable by our actions and the things that we can use in terms of personal protective equipment. So masks, for example, face shields, hygiene, both our personal hygiene, building hygiene, and then also air hygiene, which we're gonna get into uh, next. Um, I do wanna talk a little bit about um, the differences in terms of the particles, which are again, the host, a host to the virus and a lot of their distribution within a space comes into terminology that some of you of course will be familiar with in terms of aerodynamics you have gravity that's affected you've got lift you got drag and i know just about everybody online today at some point as a child you probably were sitting on a couch looking at the dust particles in the air that were, of course highlighted by the sunlight coming in and you know that some of these particles settle down some of them stay afloat some of them will travel with the airflow so airflow within a space is important, and we'll get into that when we start talking about ventilation systems and airflow. Um, but understand that some of these particles do uh, drop very quickly, and that's where this distancing comes into play. But we also know some of the particles will remain suspended in the air and become part of the conveyor system, which is the airflow within a space. And that's why those of us that early on recognize that social distancing is circumstantial the particles aren't that smart they don't have an onboard navigational system that says at one meter they stop or two meters they stop or 20 meters they stop that's just not the case at all um, if they're in the airstream they will travel on the airstream and of course what happens is they do get diluted um, unless the source increases and then of course then the quantities as you move further away from the infected persons in plural, there can also be an increase further and further away. So lots of factors at play there. So let's go to the next uh, slide, uh, if you would. So we'll talk about temperature considerations in the normal discussion on uh, HVAC and then what's in buildings. There's not a whole lot, unless you get into more industrial buildings like coolers, freezers, industrial meat packing plants. There's been a lot of super spreading events in these uh, types of buildings because the virus is, has an ability to stay active in these colder, drier conditions. And um, so, but in most buildings, like the offices that we're talking about here in homes, the temperature profiles that we see in spaces aren't gonna have a whole lot of effect uh, on design work, for example, or even the mitigation strategies. Although there was a recent paper that was published talking about uh, high temperatures um, for 
rendering the, the virus uh, less viable. But these temperatures are typically much higher than what you would have within the HVAC design systems. And even if you could, say for example, if you're doing a hydronic system and you could get the surface of the coils up around 140, 150 degrees, then you're going to introduce other issues in terms of uh, thermal comfort and cycling and these types of things. So, Gord, I don't know if you have any other comments on that. If you do, it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on it. I, I'm with you, Robert. Uh, I'm with you, Robert. The 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 idea that we could somehow, in a in a typical HVAC system, control a temperature that would have some mitigation effect that uh, doesn't sound promising. That is, we would freeze our customers out, or we would boil them out before we uh, had any impact. Yeah. So, I would say, you know, in terms of most of the people here, you know, again, the folks on, unless you're a an expert and, and you really understand the stuff, most of the stuff within the HVAC world is not going to affect the virus and the transmission path based on temperature. I suppose if you really wanted to get into things like um, buoyancy and downdraft, I mean, there may be a discussion where, you know, we know in cold climates, for example, that warm air hits a cold surface like a surface of glass, for example that you're going to get downdraft and that downdraft then can pick up anything in its path. So if I'm, for example, if I'm an infected individual and I'm sitting next to a window and I'm exhaling the virus into the space and the air coming off that window picks up the virus from me and takes it into the room, I suppose the, the velocity of that air or the density, the volume of that air, which is going to be a function of the temperature, might have a role to play. But again, we're getting, we're splitting hairs here and getting talking about stuff that, yeah, might be have an academic interest, but in terms of practical information, probably very little. Downdraft's going to occur regardless. You know, temperature might, will have a little bit of a role in there, but ultimately very little effect. So let's get into the next one, which is humidity. And humidity is interesting. Um, there's, it is one of the elements that has an effect, we know it does, uh, in terms of viabilities, and there's been lots of studies over the years. Um, not all of them uh, agreeing, by the way, there's, that is an, a subject area that it has debates. But people like uh, Dr. Stephanie Taylor, um, who was a physician, that went on to get her master's degree in architecture has uh, created a, a website, uh, 40 to 60 relative humidity.org, I think it is, where they make the case that, you know, controlling humidity is one of the mitigation strategies. Uh, but certainly when we know that when we can maintain 40 to 60%, they've demonstrated this in hospitals that these uh, particles tend to settle out on the surfaces much quicker where they can then be clean. So in terms of surface hygiene, uh, the the higher the humidity, the, the better. Uh, they do have data that suggests that when the humidity gets low, that the uh, particles containing the viruses can stay airborne longer, thus increasing the potential risk for people to inhale it further away. So, there is that element out there, and I don't think we should ignore it. Um, it's an ongoing component that is getting attention. Uh, there are certainly sufficient uh, experts in the field that suggest that we ought to uh, pay attention to it. The challenge that we have um, for those of us that are in cold climates, and I'm not sure where everybody is from here on the call, but you know, it's not uncommon, like, for example, where I am, where it can get down to minus 40 degrees uh, Fahrenheit or Celsius, uh, gets certainly down to minus 20 or so out in the east. And we can have issues with our building sciences when we get into these higher humidities, uh, for example, condensation on cold surfaces. And we know that if we increase the moisture in a space, we also increase the vapor pressure in the room, which will drive the vapor uh, into cavities, holes, wherever there's leaks, and of course, then this, then of course, can then change state, and then you get moisture issues within wall cavities, roof cavities, this type of thing. So, it's not to say that we uh, 
shouldn't be looking to uh, get the humidity up, but we can only do that provided that we fix the buildings that we're occupying. And Gord, I don't know if you have any further comments on that. It'd be interesting to hear your thoughts. Right. And thank you, Robert. It's a nice segue, actually, in in exactly that. So one, you know, we always talk about high performance new housing, and we talk about oh, we hear people say, oh, you're building the house too tight. No, you want to build it tight, and you want to have triple glazed windows so that you can raise the relative humidity in in the house. So a net zero house, for example, that's incredibly airtight, triple glazed windows has inch and a half or two inches of insulated sheathing on the outside, that house is far less prone to moisture issues. I can keep my house at 45% year round in a cold climate, not as cold as Edmonton, but uh, you know, Northern, sorry, well, I'll say at mid Ontario, minus 20, minus 25 Celsius, and I never see condensation on the windows. So I can maintain a healthier relative humidity in a really good high performance house. So another reason for HVAC contractors to support the idea of high performance uh, building construction. Um, and then I, I just wanted to make the note, uh, Robert, it was kind of interesting for me to see that old Sterling chart, right? It was, I think it was the 70s mm. that was developed. Many of you've yeah. seen it, we showed it at CMHC for years, these bars that showed that the healthy range from a many aspects was 40 to 60 percent that's gotten us into a little bit of trouble because i hear people say 40 to 60 what i think you agree we really mean is 35 to 45 in winter notwithstanding condensation and 50 55 in summer as opposed to 40 60 year round we do have some clients who want to try to keep the air at 60 percent in the winter time well that's a non-starter but if yeah. we we as HVAC folks said we're going to try to maintain 35, 45 to 45 in the winter, 50 to 55 in the summer. Boy, that's tremendous opportunities. Humidification systems, dehumidification systems, proper ventilation, ERVs all have a part to play in that humidity control. Yeah, absolutely. So those are good comments. And I know when we were practicing uh, that we would say to our clients that typically we want a 35, 55 plus or minus 5% on either end, which is exactly what Gord is referring to as you shift through the seasons. And uh, so that is, those are the ideal numbers, but you can't achieve that without addressing the building enclosure. And one of the things that this pandemic is bringing awareness to is the relationships, the importance of integrated design. It's not enough to have, you know, the building engineer or the building enclosure designer doing systems and the mechanical people and electrical, because that comes into play. You have to work together as a team in order to create these, these ideal environments. And it's also really important that we understand that these are just mitigation strategies. We're not saying that, you know, if you maintain the right temperature and the right humidity that you're going to improve people's health. That's not a true statement. But we are saying that it improves the environment that people occupy and by connection it has going to have an influence on the individuals. So our job as HVAC technicians and building technicians, engineers and scientists is to use the knowledge that we have, the equipment that we have available, the materials to create these ideal environments so that people can occupy them with the lowest risk of being exposed to all kinds of different illnesses, not just the virus itself, but there's other things, mold that's associated, gas, outgassing, all of these things come into play. So uh, ventilation is obviously going to be a subject matter here, and we're going to talk about it. I do want to uh, make some clear statements here that there is at this point very little evidence that suggests that the HVAC systems are distributing the virus. In other words, there's no definitive uh, research projects that are saying that we're that we're taking the virus in through the exhaust systems uh, on a say on an all air system and then distributing that virus into other rooms. That is not, at this point, a statement that we can say is happening. We can say that there is a potential there for it, but there's no data that suggests that that's actually occurring. The question mark that's being left out there is that there was a research project where they used, I think it was uh, minks, 
and they had two holding cells, one above the other, and they actually connected the two uh, holding cells with a uh, duct, and they put in the lower uh, holding cell a mink that was infected, and then monitored the healthy mink, which was in the upper cell, and eventually that mink became infected. So how did the virus manage to make it, um, you know, from one holding cell through into another holding cell? And of course, the only thing that connected the two was the duct. So we don't want to draw too many conclusions there yet, but we do know that the virus can migrate through on the as the airstream is a conveyor belt and that there is that possibility but we want to make sure that we're not out there telling people that you know your ventilation or your hvac system is going to take the virus from one space and put it into another uh, because we just don't have research work that suggests that but we do know that based on some studies recently uh, that they are able to find the virus at the inlet uh, at the exhaust uh, registers. So they do know that if it's in the air, that it can travel throughout the space and it can get to these places. They have found it on filters uh, in the air handling systems. And so we'll talk about filters here coming up next. So it's really important that at this point, what we know is that Individuals who are infected will exhale. The virus will come into the space. It will either, or some of it will drop, some of it they'll leave behind on surfaces, and some of it will stay in the air. And since that air is a conveyor belt as it's moving through the space, that it will find itself, some of it, uh, in the entrance uh, ports of the exhaust air system, and it will find itself uh, collected on filters and that's as much as we know at this point um, I can't tell you today that there have been cases I don't know of any cases through the research where somebody in another space was was infected um, that's definitive and but just know that that is an area right now that's under a bunch of studies um, so when we talk about ventilation we're talking about well how do we reduce the risk well it's about reduce it's really about reducing the concentrations and you should know that this is a wild card that the experts are still trying to understand you know what sort of dose is necessary to infect people and it, the numbers of course are all over the board so i'm not prepared to say what the numbers are but i am prepared to say that when it's in the space if we want to reduce the risk we have to be able to reduce the concentrations and we can do that by getting rid of air and bringing outdoor air in. Now, notice I said outdoor air. I didn't say fresh air, and Gord, I think, will agree with me on this, is that we have to be very careful uh, that when we use the term uh, fresh air, that that's implying that the air coming in is actually fresh. And when we say fresh, there's an implication that it's free of toxic gases, free of toxic particles, these types of things, that the outdoor air, um, may not always be of a quality that is beneficial to the occupant. And so that's why, you know, individuals like myself, of course, we're very much pro natural ventilation wherever it makes sense. But there are gonna be places like, for example, in Toronto or Vancouver, or really highly populated areas that opening up a window also exposes things like noise and security issues. And there are possibilities for air quality issues. So when we talk about ventilation, we want to make sure that we're talking about bringing air in of a quality that's suitable for breathing. If it isn't, it has to be treated. And uh, so that's why this can get a little bit complex. There's no set uh, rules. Like There's no book out there right now that can say to you, you know, that if you apply these principles, they're going to apply to every project in every part of the world. That's just simply not the case. You're going to have to look at each building in its uh, location and you're going to have to do an assessment on that so for example if we take a building that is out in a rural area where there's no factories around there's no contaminants well then that air chances are is going to be reasonably good unless of course that same building is an area where 
fires exist. So forest fires, of course, in Canada, we have a lot of problems with that, particularly in the West. Well, you know, you're not going to be opening up your window when there's a forest fire going on. And when you get into the cold climates, you know, how much air are you going to need in order to dilute a space? Well, that's when you have to start looking at the management of that air coming in, and that's where CO2 sensors uh, might have a play in terms of monitoring what is an acceptable amount of ventilation. And so there's a lot of different schools of thought on CO2 uh, sensors and using that as a means of saying, okay, well, the air is starting to, uh, you know, if you start getting up above 1,000 parts per million, 12, 15, 1,600 parts per million, you know what, it's time to get rid of uh, some of the stale air in that space and start to bring in more outdoor air and so the ability to adjust our outdoor air inlet is really important um you know when we're trying to manage it so there is utility in the co2 sensors um and i think you know and there's two different schools of thought there if you look at the ashray school of thought versus the riva school of thought the ashray school of thought is well we're already doing ventilation based on building type and occupancy and so that in and of itself will control the CO2 levels. And so it's not necessary to actually provide instrumentation that the system itself should already be controlling it. There's some logic to that. In Europe, where they use mainly or a lot of hydronic systems and they're not doing ventilation systems like we do here in North America, then they have a, a much higher utility because then they can use the CO2 readings to then say, okay, you know, we, we're not using ventilation like they are over North America, uh, so we should maybe try to find a way to get the CO2 down. Um, so those are the two schools of thoughts. I think there's a mix. Um, Gord, I don't know, do you have a thought on that? Well, it's interesting that, that you ask. Uh, I had a, 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 back in June, a technology officer for a large property management firm in Toronto asking me about, you know, what should I be doing? What, from an HVAC perspective, he said, I know what we're gonna do for our clients, our tenants on surfaces and cleaning, but what should I have my HVAC contractor do? And first thing I said was, well, at least determine that you have the proper ventilation rates. And, and he said, well, from an energy perspective, how do I do that? Well, we can use CO2 controllers, but fundamentally many, many HVAC systems, the rooftop economizers have been closed off now for years. And I said, I've done indoor air quality work, at least get the ventilation back up to ASHRAE rates, the nominally 15 CFM per person. That's what ASHRAE is saying from a COVID perspective. And if you want to go finer than that, then CO2 is, is a pretty good indication of occupancy. That's really what CO2 is about, is an indication of occupancy. And for COVID, for for this virus, it's still the recommended 15 CFM per person or using CO2 as a way of mitigating the amount of um, outdoor air that's coming in. And then to the next slide is this air treatment and filtration. Okay, now I need to treat that air as it's coming in to take out the fine particles. So I, I was just giving him a sense of first it's ventilate, second it's checking and maintaining and making sure you have the right filters and and then the right humidity and temperature control. And just that short checklist was he found really valuable to go back to the HVAC guys and says, here's three things I need you to do for me and that I can give to my tenants and say, check, we've got these things done. Yeah, that well said. And and in fact, I don't know, I can't really add anything to that. Uh, I mean, we get into some of the details on the filtration and the UV light stuff, but you're absolutely right. You know, go back, look at the systems that are there, make sure that they're actually working as per design, fix them, That's, that is that is the number one step. If it's a new design, making sure that you are you know, in compliance with the standards. Um, I do want to talk about there, you need to know that there is debate within the engineering community, particularly at the ASHRAE level, in terms of ventilation rates, for sure. Um, a lot of the debates stemmed earlier on from energy requirements. Um, I've always been of the school of thought that um, human health should trump energy and that we should design ventilation systems erroring on the safe side. I think if we actually looked at ventilation rates and then looked at uh, source control, that oftentimes we'd find out maybe that the ventilation rate should be a little bit higher. We also have to recognize that when we're doing designs, 
that that building is going to last many, many decades and there will be many, many different occupancies over the lifetime of that building and that if we design ventilation systems for only one type of occupancy, when a new occupancy moves in, we might be underventilating the space. So I've always been of the sort of the thought, let's say for example, for housing, that most houses ultimately become an extension of the in, uh, institutional healthcare system. People want to die at home. Uh, so, you know, as people age and they become ill, ventilation becomes incredibly important, but the codes don't require us to pay attention to that. They just have a minimum value. So when I was a practicing uh, designer, uh, we always had ventilation rates that were much higher than what the standards required, but the systems that we put in place were also variable. So in other words, we could wind them up or wind them down, depending on what the needs were of the people and the occupancy of that building during the lifetime of that building. So, I, Gord, I don't know if you have any further comments on that. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm totally with you, and you know the 2016 or 2013 ASHRAE rates increased, but not not from a health perspective, but for recognition of um, air leakage. That is, tighter buildings need more fresh air. But I, I, there, this comes up. There's a review right now of CSAF 326, uh, which is the Canadian Residential Ventilation Standard, and the first question is, how much do we really need? And there's uh, there's still debate over what is the right amount of air uh, for occupants. I, I would say to those on the call, while we're having that debate, ventilate at least the rate that ASHRAE says, which is 15 nominally 15 CFM per person. Let's at least get that done because there's so many buildings that just don't even have that amount of ventilation. So many houses that don't have that amount of ventilation. And let's be really clear, I, I need to say, regardless of how tight the building is, regardless of how tight the building is, every building in Canada needs the capacity for continuous mechanical ventilation at nominally 15 CFM. The formula is a little different than that. Uh, it's number of people and square footage and usage of the building, but get a mm. get an ash rate calculator. You can get them online that you dump in. Here's my floor area. Here's my number of people. Here's what I'm using the building for, and it'll give you the ventilation rate. And go tomorrow and start measuring all of the ventilation rates or the ventilation rate of all the buildings that you work in, and let's at least get them to that level. And then we can debate from there. Should we need more? Sure, more is better, but let's start with the minimum. Yeah. Totally with you on that. So in terms of the actual, you know, uh, equipment, um, it's really important. I mean, I both Gordon and I've been in the industry a long, long time. I've been up the technology ladder and back down again. I like simple stuff that doesn't require any power. And uh, so, in terms of filtration, we do know that obviously the at the upper end, the HEPA filters, um, you know. We'll pull out a large percentage of the particulate matter that uh, that is uh, carrying the virus and even the virus itself. Um, but we do know that for practical everyday buildings that a minimum of MERV uh, 13 is effective. And that filtration can be either in the air handling system or portable in space filtration. And in my own personal life uh, where we have uh, fans and family that have concerns over the virus, we've prepared them um, that, you know, in the event that someone in the family gets sick, that you be able to isolate them in a room while they get better, hopefully, and that uh, you can either buy portable units, uh, you know, that uh, come with a rating, and maybe, Gord, you can talk about that later, um, or you can make your own, and, you know, we've We've provided for, like I said, friends and families, simple box fan with a MERV 13 strapped to the back of it. If you want to get fancy, you can do multiple filters, like actually build a box with four filters on all sides, a solid surface on the bottom if you want, and then just place a you know box fan on the top. And those assemblies, which you know for under 500 bucks can you know provide you know a decent room four or five hundred square feet uh, with a high performance system for a third to half the price of what you might pay on the street uh, for you know a manufactured type device so when it comes to filtration as I said um, 
you know, we can pull particles out of the air, and those particles do contain viruses, and we can't, and it is a mitig part of a mitigation strategy. We're not saying that if you put in a high performance filtration system that you can walk around without wearing a mask or not be concerned about being affected. That's not what we're saying at all. What we're saying is that as part of a multi layer strategy, and I'm going to talk about that in our concluding remarks, is that it's one of the tools to help reduce the risk. Gore, do you have any uh, comment on that? Yeah, I just, uh, you've just said it, you've said it a couple of times, it's about reducing, reducing the concentration, either through filtration or ventilation. And the question's always going to come up, what, what if we killed it? What if we UV'd it? What if we um, ionized it or something? And Ashray's comment is, if ventilation and human, and sorry, ventilation and filtration are your first two strategies. Killing stuff is more difficult. Talks about retention time. You have to worry about the technology you're going to use because if it's harmful to viruses, what else is it harmful to? So just keep in mind, folks, and you guys had it right on your survey, ventilate and filter. MERV 13 is a great number. I like your concept of the isolation room. Imagine two people in a house, one who's really susceptible. Maybe it's a really young person with a, 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 a asthma or allergies, or maybe it's a a senior, an elder in the home, let's create a really nice clean room for them. That room you'd keep under positive pressure with really well ventilated, filtered air. And then you have the infected person and you'd keep them under negative pressure with, again, really well ventilated, filtered air. And I see long term, the positive pressure makes sense because you talked about people who want to die at home who want to be cared for at home, let's start helping people create what we called in the air quality world, an oasis. Start, this is a nice long-term strategy, not just for COVID, but have a room where it's really clean, safe, healthy place to live. And it's positively pressurized with really good outdoor air that's properly filtered, either HEPA or MERV, minimum MERV 13, maybe even separate heating and cooling. Imagine the opportunity as an HVAC contractor to be able to do that in a house. That, I think that's so powerful. Yeah, it really is. And, you know, that and that is a practical application because we do know that a lot of the transmission and infections that occur do happen when someone comes from the outside world into the home and then passes it on to other members of the family. And if that individual is just you know, experiencing mild symptoms, headache, fever, sore throat, you know, where they're not needed to be hospitalized, well, then we need to have that individual in a space that is going to reduce the risk to everybody else in the home. And Gord made some really good comments there. And it really, it's an isolated room, but, you know, not at a hospital scale, but the principles are still the same. And so, as I was saying, for friends and family, we've set them up with these low-cost, effective filtration systems. Um, we've provided them with humidification that has UV light to treat the water, not the air, but the water that's being used for the humidification system. And we've provided them with electric space heaters. So that way, you know, we can open up the window, provide some uh, access to the outdoor air, uh, we provide the filtration within the room itself, and then if that window is open due to, you know, reducing the concentration of the room, having the fresh air, keeping the CO2 levels down, then the electric space heater can kick in and provide the heat. That is really a triage application that you can set up for people's houses, all right? So electric space heater, humidification, and one of these filtration systems and you just designate a room. And I, you know, what we've been telling our client, not clients, but our colleagues, friends, family, is listen, you know, there's a possibility that someone's gonna get infected, they're gonna bring it home, um, and you're gonna need a room for that person to stand while they get better. You know what, master bedroom, if it's got its own bathroom, now you've got an exhaust fan, you, and the person can stay in there, they can do their own hygiene without having anybody else you know, risk themselves or take any more necessary risks than what's necessary. So, you know, if you can get a room with a bathroom, um, you put that filter in, box fan with some filters in it, or buy one of the manufactured ones, a humidifier, an electric space heater, 
you know, you've got everything there. You've got the exhaust fan from the bathroom to get rid of air. You've got an open window to bring fresh air in. You've got a filter to filter the air. And you've got an electric space heater there to compensate for any cold temperature drops or temperature drops it might do to having the window open. So that's my co my comment on that. When we get into and onto the zippier stuff, you know, again, I would, again, I love the simple stuff. Filters work. Humidifiers work. Open windows work, exhaust fans work. When you start to talk about things like UV and you start getting into some of the ionization stuff, uh, you've got people that are spraying hydrogen peroxide into spaces, all of that, I personally would just tell you to just stop um, and think about what the consequences are. Um, there has There was a recent research like within the last two weeks there was a large publication out of the UK that looked at these advanced technologies and, I'm, and please understand I'm not saying that these technologies don't work I'm just saying that the researchers have found is that some manufacturers have done a lot of really good work in terms of getting their products tested making sure that the byproducts that are produced don't cause respiratory issues for the occupants in the space because that is the big problem um, and they have uh, done these testing and it's and it's validated and it's good stuff but for every one manufacturer that has gone and taken those steps there's another pick a number half a dozen that have not done the testing and they're out there selling the high high technology stuff and they're not uh, up front with the consequences of that equipment and so I would encourage you uh, and I think, Michael, I gave you two links uh, that hopefully you've distributed or we can bring them up afterwards. And that's the only two links you, you need. There's so much information out there in the world right now. And I've consolidated uh, all of the stuff that I know, not on my links, but links that other people have provided that you can go to and that can be your resource. And one of the resources um, has this study that talks about all the different filtration options out there and air treatment options talks about uv talks about you know your basic mechanical filters and then it gets into some of this high performance stuff and the associated risks so i would encourage you to do that um so, so we're point, robert i'll just point out there is a very very lengthy handout that robert is referring to that everybody can download as the handouts if they have any issues with it you can send me an email afterwards and i can also get it to you by email yeah great so let's uh, finish up this presentation and just talk about you know these are multi you're not going to get a hundred percent mitigate a risk reduction by just using filtration or mass or humidity control you have to use a multi-layered strategy and as Gord already talked about ventilation filtration then you know dealing with uh, other other treatment tools making sure that we recognize that distancing social distancing is it's circumstantial there is no safe for sure distance in one meter two meter pick a number it doesn't really matter if it's in the air we're sharing that air then all distances have to be suspect so that's why it's really important that we wear masks and then making sure that hygiene is also done not only building hygiene but personal hygiene air hygiene of course is part of the filtration ventilation strategy and you know that's really what's important and so you have your own responsibilities as a member of society to protect other people around you protect yourselves and we do that by making sure that we can stay away from people as much as we possibly can if we're in the presence of an unknown risk which is a stranger on the street somebody you don't know you need to wear a mask because you need to protect them and they need to wear a mask and they protect you. Uh, we want to make sure that we stay away from highly densulated spaces. We don't want to be in spaces where there's going to be lots of people who might, some may be contaminated, some maybe not, anywhere where there's poor ventilation. And you know what? Unless you are an expert, and this is some of the things that you need to tell your clients, if you don't know what your ventilation systems are what their capacity is whether they're functioning or not you may as well assume that it's a poorly ventilated space we want to avoid that or correct it so these are all part of a multi-layer strategy so that's about all i have uh you know in terms of the cole's notes for COVID. gore do you have anything else you want to add to this well uh, thank you robert if i could make a shameless plug for uh, some training that i developed for um, hii 
that they're going to be offering, and please watch for it, hrii.ca, uh, on exactly this, the opportunities associated with COVID. And, and I'm going to say it this way, you need to ventilate houses for COVID, but you also need to ventilate houses for mold and moisture and CO2 and so on, or buildings in general. You need to filter for COVID, but you also need to filter for uh, outdoor particulates, you also, uh, you know, PM 2.5 and wood smoke and filter from inside. So all the things that you're going to do for COVID are the same things that that you should be doing anyway. It's just another reason to talk to people about these things. Your commercial clients, your your office clients, your residential clients, help them understand that you're a part to play in this. ASHRAE's gotten some really good information that says HVAC contractors should get a phone call. They're the ones that can manage ventilation, filtration, humidity control. Those are the top three things. And out of that, you start thinking about all the opportunities from business side of things that we could be do, it could be doing in terms of maintenance, in terms of tune-up, and in terms of equipment sales. So it's it's our part to play in this. We have things that we are able to offer and value that we can bring. And so look for that HRA training. It's about a two and a half hour program uh, that walks through, goes a little more detail in the equipment side of things that you could or should be selling. Uh, that could help your clients improve the quality of air they're breathing, both in time of COVID and then overall. Excellent. All right, Mike, so let's open up the lines for anybody that has questions. Perfect. I was going to segue to that. So we're going to play 50 questions and there may not be 50 of them. So uh, I'm going to throw these uh, at both of you and sort of see what you have to add to it. Um, very first question that came up is that we very – little did we speak about HEPA. What are your thoughts on HEPA and COVID? Well, HEPA is, is going to give you the highest level of filtration performance that you can get out there. And, you know, if if you buy a standalone unit um, with HEPA filtration and there's units out there, you can make your own, then power requirements are contained within that device. But when you start changing systems, now you have to start paying attention to the pressure drop across that unit and what's the impact it's going to have. So, you know, yes, HEPA is good, but what are the consequences of using it? And so that's why, you know, a skilled technician needs to go out. And as Gord said, you got to go and you're going to have to survey these systems, you know, to see what, what is their capacity, what are they doing now? What is their capacity to change and what are the impacts of doing that? That's my comments. And and I would add, just think about the clean air delivery rate. You could filter 200 CFM at 100% or 99%, or you could filter 1,000 CFM through MERV-15, which is, say, 50% effective against the virus. Boy, I got 500 clean air delivery rate off the 1,000 times 50, or I got 200 on the, uh, on the HEPA. So I'm not against HEPA. Maybe it's a portable. But think about the total clean air delivery rate. Where am I best able to do this? Yeah, Gore, do you want to just talk about that, the catter, just so people know what that's all about? Yeah, the idea is to imagine, um, well, I'll give you the example that you can buy online for 250 bucks, those little tower things that they talk about, Dyson or something like that, clean air. It's got a ionization and HEPA. And when you look at it in the sound level, it, it's running about 10 CFM. Okay, so even if it's 99% or 100% effective at 10 CFM, wow, how many time, how many hours do you have to run that to, to clean out the air? It only has a clean air delivery rate of 10 CFM versus, let's say, um, 80 CFM coming out the 5-inch register or 60 to 80 CFM coming out the 5-inch register. If I was able to clean that at 50%, that would give me 30 cubic feet per minute of fresh air or of clean air. So imagining the filtration level times the ventil sorry, times the um, uh, airflow that you have, that's called the clean air delivery rate. So it's the efficiency times the CFM. And what you're trying to do is get to say, well, uh, how many air change rates do you want in a room? One air change to six air changes. Um, the dental offices are looking for 50 air changes to be able to allow people to come back into the space right away. Okay, I'd need to know the clean air delivery rate to get the 50 air changes in that room, an eight by eight by eight room. How many CFM do I need? 
uh, what efficiency do I have to have it at? So sometimes you employ HEPA, uh, and sometimes you take a MERV 13 and at whatever uh, efficiency you have. Yeah, and it's really important. There are tools out there. So Harvard and uh, Colorado University developed a clean air delivery rate uh, spreadsheet tool. So you can just plug in, you know, the parameters, and then it'll it'll provide some recommendations. So just know that the two links that uh, Mike's going to give you later on, or whenever that happens, uh, that tool is available. And in fact, there's many tools out there now, Excel-based spreadsheet tools, some standalone, uh, which will do risk assessment. So that's that's really important. So Mike, next question. Yeah, so the other thing that ties really nice on is we have multiple people talking about MERV rating of air filters. So it really comes down to, uh, is there any published data that shows what MERV rating of an air filter is actually going to be able to capture the airborne COVID-19 particles and do we know how effective they are? Speaking specifically to the size of this virus and what a MERV-13 could do, for example. So, yeah, so for example, well, first thing we need to be very clear is that, as again, the virus does not travel alone. It's not bare. Um, so even though it's incredibly tiny in itself, it's the particles that it travels and that we're trying to capture. So those can be anywhere on the spectrum. And the MERV is actually, a rating, minimum efficiency reporting value, uh, that you can get the standard, uh, ASHRAE standard for 152, I think it is, or 52, 152. Oh, I should know this off the top of my head. Anyways, it's an ASHRAE standard uh, for it. 52. And it 52, yeah. Okay, thanks, Gord. So it describes everything from like MERV 2 up to the HEPA filters, what percentage of, or what efficiency uh, is of those of those particular filters. So it's out there. Um, where there's a bit of a challenge for the consumer or even for those that are buying filters has to do with some of the manufacturers who have their own rating scale. So anything that's got a MERV rating, easy, easy peasy, because you just go to the standard and you can look at the specs. But like, for example, 3M have their own rating system. Like you have, I think you have to get up into their model number 2300 which starts to perform more, more like a more of 13, more of 14 uh, filter. If you get anything less than that, like into the thousands, the 1200 series, they're just not effective. They won't do what you're looking for. So I, that's my comment on that. Gordon? And my comment, Michael, would be this. So yes, the MERV ratings are there. The The issue is the, the higher the MERV rating, the more efficient it is against smaller particles or particulates. But the more the more restrictive it is, and I I just want to give my two cents worth. I've been into dozens of houses where there's three or four filters sitting beside the furnace, and I ask, "What's this about?" Well, every mechanical contractor comes in and tells me that one's affecting the flow of the furnace. I shouldn't use it, and all I do is take out my digital pressure gauge and I measure the pressure drop across the filter. I'm going to challenge all of you before you tell somebody not to use the filter they're using. Don't say that's what's causing your problem until you've actually measured the pressure drop. And I've measured the flow change. I was at one the other day. The 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 mechanical contractor claimed that that was causing the problem that the homeowner's filter. I put a pressure drop across it. It was about 0.15 inches of water column, not that bad. And then I measured the flow difference in the furnace and it was a 7% drop in airflow. Not a catastrophic drop, but a 7% drop, which you might say, well, that could be a, a problem. It might be, but in this house, that wasn't the problem. There was other things going on in the house. So measure would be my point. Measure the static pressure of your MERV 13 filter and determine whether it's actually impacting the flow across the air handler or not. I love that. Awesome, yep. great, great answer. So uh, I'm gonna segue into UV light systems. So there's lots of questions on UV light systems and you know some concerns. My own personal concern on UV light systems with everything going with aluminum coils now is those systems not being installed properly and having premature coil failures. It's It's something I think about more than I want to. We have multiple people asking the question of what are your thoughts on duct-mounted UV light systems and how effective they are in killing the germs? Uh, and the other comment would be, uh, how long do we think this virus is gonna kill, live on these filters, like regular MERV filters, and whether UV should be used to, again to, to kill that virus? So what are, what are your thoughts on that? So there's lots of demonstrated success with UV in, uh, 
prisons, hospital settings, where they're treating upper air uh, spaces. So they've actually got the UV lights actually in the space, treating the upper area of the room, and they do work. Um, in terms of ducts, you know, there there's also demonstrated, and people like uh, Dr. Bill Bonfleff from uh, Penn State University and Dr. Shelley Miller from the University of Colorado have written about uh, the application of UV lights and what's necessary. So I'm not a UV light expert. Um, I have used UV light in my past practices doing indoor air quality remediation work. Um, it does work well uh, for some things. In terms of going back onto coils and filters, uh, any contaminated filter you can treat it with the UV light if you like, but I, if you're, you know, replacing the filter um, would be, you know, it's going to have a certain life lifetime effectiveness, and you know, monitoring the pressure again, that's where a skilled technician is going to come into play, is looking at how that filter loads up and the effectiveness or the effect on the airflow, um, and changing it out. Um, rather than killing the viruses with the UV light. I, I don't know, Gord, do you, I don't know. I'm stumbling here because I don't want to come out outright and say something that, let me put it this way, UV has a, has a place. In terms of, right. and it, yeah, go ahead, Gord. Exactly, that's, that's what ASHRAE says. There's no peer reviewed data, but undoubtedly it can work. It's, think about this, we talked about clean air delivery rate. Now you got to add the, the uh, kill time. So now you have to think about how long would it have to be illuminated? At what intensity? At what wavelength? For how long? So let me give you a quick example. Let's say you put UV light in the supply duct of a furnace. That's 1,200 CFM. Sorry, feet per minute. Let, I'm just using velocity. It's going to be easy math. You're going to say, how do you know it's 1,200? It may not be 1,200. That's 1,200 feet per minute, okay? Divide that by 60 feet per second. That would be 1,200 divided by 60 would be 20 feet in one second that the air would move. So if, with depending on the, you'd have to ask the UV manufacturer what wavelength and what intensity and how long would it actually take to kill the virus? It's not instantaneous. How long would it have to be illuminated for? And if they said one second, you would say, okay, then that, has to be illuminated for 20 feet. Boy, you'd have to illuminate 20 feet of the duct in order to get the kill rate. Now you might say, well, I could up the intensity. I could put it in the return air duct and that's gonna be maybe only 600 feet per minute. So now I only have to illuminate 10 feet of duct or maybe I can get the intensity up and 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 so that you know and so on and so on. So you could start to see, oh, there's some math here. It's not just UV kill stuff. UV kills stuff at a certain retention time, at a certain wavelength, UVC in this case, um, at a certain intensity. Okay, if you're willing to do all of that work and then make sure if it's also killing viruses, what else is it killing or affecting like coils and so on, all right. And what you learn is, all right, hospitals, dental offices, prisons, yeah, maybe. Houses, ventilate, filter, humidity control. That should be your bread and butter. Get that going first. So that's why we brought Gordon on the call. Yeah, that, that, was, a, that was a pretty solid answer, Gordon. <laughs> um, Scott's got a question just specifically it has to do with ASHRAE suggesting three air changes. Um, you guys have any thoughts on that? He's talking in specifically with office ventilation and the conflicting info on CO2. Well, there's numbers in between three and six air changes per hour, and it goes back to what Gord said earlier, ASHRAE, 15 CFM, or I guess that worked out to 30 liters per second. I guess that's a conversion, something like that. Seven and a half liters, the other way, yeah. seven and a half liters. Yes. Or seven and a half liters. Yeah, so I don't know, Gord, do you want to take that one on? Well, air change rate versus 
you know, so ASHRAE has said, just, so there's two things going on here. How much ventilation do I need to dilute? And we use CO2 as the metric, if you will. That is, we assume if the CO2 levels are well diluted, that probably means other pollutants are well polluted. You might say, well, the virus needs more than that. And sure. Or if you had a particular pollutant in a particular environment, you would say, I want more ventilation than that. But from a people perspective, the CO2 rate is really based on the number of people. And so seven and a half liters per second is sort of the nominal. Again, I will say, go back to ASHRAE, look up, you know, it's a gymnasium, it's a swimming pool, it's whatever, that's the ventilation rate. Second to that is the distribution, the movement of that air. And sometimes people get confused with ventilation versus, I'll say, circulation. And you'll hear this idea, I want six air changes per hour of air movement back through my filtration system. That might include one air change of ventilation, outdoor air, but it and then five times of recirculated air. So I need you to be careful on when they say air change, they want outdoor air at six air changes per hour. Why do we need that? Uh, maybe it's because of the occupancy level. Maybe it's crammed in room. And one, stay away. Don't go into a crammed in room during COVID. Um, so that's really the premise of, and, and CDC has those guidelines for dental offices or medical offices that because of the potential concentration of virus in the air, when those people leave the room, you wanna flush that room out. And it gives you, if you want people to be back in with, within six minutes, for example, I think it's 60 air changes. If you don't mind waiting 20 minutes, then you're down to five air changes. And I may have those numbers wrong, but it's right on the CDC website of retention time or, or flush out time, if you will, flush out time versus um, uh, the, the uh, yeah, flush out time to get rid of uh, vi viruses that may be left over hanging around from when other infected people were in the room. And that was assuming there was an infected person in the room. If you don't know if they're infected, you assume they're infected. And so you do this flush out rate to make the next person safe. That That's kind of the point. Yeah. You know, like when I look at my own practice where we did dedicated outdoor air systems and so we separated the ventilation from the thermal comfort system. So when there was a requirement for ventilation, that air was the was the air change rate and the ventilation rate, because whatever we required to remove air out of that space, that same air had to come in and had to be conditioned. So there was no recirculation involved. And I you know, so for us, it was a much more simpler concept than it was when you're starting to use air as both the ventilation and the heating and then the cooling system. So, but Gord just, Gord explained that well. So, Mike, next question. All right. So I'm going to throw the last question out. It's going to be a two-parter. So, uh, Jay had actually asked the question, with so many people working at home, what would you consider the ideal filtration? An ideal could play into the cost conversations we've had. But the other one that got thrown out, which is pretty good, we can tie to this, is what are you doing in your own homes? So I have uh, a home and a condo that I occupy. And uh, in both cases, we have portable filtration units. So I have one in my bedroom and I have one in my office area. And those are high performance. So the one in my bedroom is actually a HEPA. Uh, and, it, and I also have humidification in there as well. My office is just a MERV 13 and also humidification. So if you were to actually look at my office right now, you would, I would, you'd be, see, I'd be in a room here that's, you know, roughly seven by 10 feet, so 70 square feet. And then there I have, you know, standalone space filtration, MERV 13, and a humidifier with a UV light. And that's what I've been doing both in the house and uh, in, in, the, in my office condo here. In my case, I'm going to go to the cot. The house was built in '93, so it's got ERV, it's got uh, MERV 13 filter uh, with a continuous circulation on the fan. I've got sealed ductwork so that my returns aren't pulling from cavities and so on. They're actually pulling from um, it's a ducted return, if you will. So I'm, I'm actually moving air correctly without going through cavities and I have moisture control summer and winter so I'm able to maintain dehumidification in the summer all houses need dehumidification my opinion well CMHC's opinion as well um, and 40% uh, in the winter I don't need to add moisture because my house is really tight but I maintain moisture between 40 and 45 in the winter 55 50 to 55 in the summer MERV 13 filter in the cottage we did 
fully ducted ERV through a HEPA filter. So it's a, a pro, an HRV. I can mention, well, you guys know the brand name. That's what Eden Energy sells. And it has uh, the, the outdoor air comes in, goes through a HEPA filter. And in my case, it's ducted directly to the bedrooms. So I have mini split, small ducted mini split units, but my fresh air is directed directly to the bedrooms. So the rooms, the bedrooms are pressurized slightly with 100% outdoor air uh, through a HEPA filter. And again, moisture managed, so on. Yeah, awesome. So yeah. Uh, we're, I, gonna, we're gonna wrap everything up, I think at this point, unless you wanna add something, Robert? I do, yeah, and that is, has to do with the renovation market and because there's a lot going on and I'm in that right now uh, where we started a renovation a year ago and uh, then COVID hit and that changed a lot in terms of scheduling and making sure that it's safe for both the occupants of the home and then safe for the trades coming in. And so just to give you my own personal experience or right, right now what's going on is we have a bungalow that uh, is being renovated and we've isolated the upstairs from the downstairs with uh, pressure control and controlling return air into the space. And we, when trades come into the building, uh, we have a, a window mounted inline direct drive exhaust fan, high capacity, and we leave uh, a window open, patio door actually. So when the trades, before anybody shows up in the morning, uh, I come out, I come to the project, I start up or open up the patio door, start up the fan, and I start getting fresh air coming through that space. And I make sure that the uh, door that seals the upstairs from the downstairs is zipped up tight. Very similar to what you would do for, you know, say asbestos control or say mold remediation where you're trying to isolate a space, almost identical uh, strategies. And we try to make sure that we don't mix uh, too many trades in the space at the same time. Everybody's instructed to come wear masks, uh, try to avoid coming close to anybody, which can be difficult. But what it has done is it's lengthened the time to complete the project. But you can do it. Um, if you just pay attention to these particular strategies. One of the other things that we also did is we did upgrade the furnace in there. So we, the original furnace had only a small filter rack for like one inch uh, filters, and it had an evaporative type humidifier on there. And personally, I'm more of a steam humidifier uh, type individual. Uh, it's just much more hygienic. So the old evaporative humidifier was removed. A, a steam humidifier was put on it. We changed the filter rack out uh, to accommodate a four inch uh, filter. And this is one of the things that's, you know, when you get into filter selection that you should be working with a filter uh, supplier that knows what they're talking about because you can get a one inch, a two inch or a four inch filter and they all have a certain capacity but the pressure drop across them uh, can actually be less for the wider unit and give you better performance. So, you know, Gord, you probably agree with that, that not all filters are the same. So you can have a MERV 11, three of them or more of 13, three of them, depending on the thickness and the surface area of the filter is gonna determine the pressure drop across that unit. So that was one of the reasons why we went to the bigger filter rack, changed the drop coming into it. And so now we have much better filtration without having an, an effect on the pressure drop on it and using the steam humidifier to make sure that uh, when the project's done and it gets recommissioned, that they've got good humidity control, good filtration control, and uh, everybody's been safe, uh, you know, in the building, the trades coming in, of course, the people occupying the space as well. So just want to share that. Yeah. Well, Michael, thanks very much for the opportunity. Great of you to uh, to put this on. I really appreciate the opportunity to be online with Robert. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Thank you everybody Obviously. for joining us. Yeah, thanks for joining us. And Gord, can you remind us of the date for the HRI training you're doing on COVID? It's just uh, as needed. That is uh, go express interest and they'll form up a course. They don't have any scheduled at the moment. They're just looking for participants right now. Awesome. And so uh, you also write quite frequently for mechanical business. I know you've got uh, something written for the February issue. What's uh, what's in that issue before we wrap up here? It's actually on radon, yet another air quality issue that we should be part of. So it's on radon. Mm. Awesome. And then obviously we can uh, read Robert's uh, rantings and, uh, and educated views on heating out. 
Um, did you have anything? Or, uh, <laughs> let you do it. Roberts gave the wrong website. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, healthyheating.com, and it's just, you know, it's a not-for-profit uh, resource, and really it's just people kept asking me, why don't I write a book? Why don't I write a book? I said, I've already written a book. It's it's my website. <laughs> so that's not true. Actually, I wrote a book. That's not true. I did. I wrote a book on thermal comfort for residential applications. That's that's. I forgot about that. How do you forget yeah. that you wrote a book? I, I don't know. It's just... <laughs> well, we'll have to make sure as a follow-up, and we'll remind everybody of Gord Cook's training. We'll remind them of your correct website, Robert, and we should send that uh, that book link out to everybody as well. All right. Thanks again. Thanks, guys.